Okay, everybody, can we get, get started here? So I'm Dick Dunning. I'm from the uh, program manager for the Center for Global Health, and I drew a short straw, and I get to be the MC today. Um, we're going to go through a few things very quickly. Um, you can see what this is all about. The one thing I'm going to say right away is that everything that we are going to present today is going to be on our website. So you don't have to sit here madly. Just like when I was here, there was one of the professors used to hand out notes, and he said, I don't want you to take notes. I want you to listen to me. Here's your notes. This is the same thing, more or less. This will all be on the website. So wanted to do this first. When we're all done, if there are questions that we didn't have time for, please send them to Anna Karbarczyk. Anna is, works with me, and she's going to coordinate these questions, and we'll sort of parse them out to people. So if there's a question about international SOS, we're going to send it to, to Larry Foley. If it's something else, we'll figure out who's going to answer it. So there we go. So here's the purpose. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to introduce ideas and thought process. We are not here to present things that you are going to take away and say, oh, this is all I need to know. It's just to get you thinking. So the, the other person that's going to be presenting with me right away is Christina Salazar. You probably know her. Most of you are probably from International Health, and she's academic coordinator for IH. So first thing I want to talk about is you are responsible. We have had lots of feedback in the past, uh, the students saying, well, couldn't you do this for us? Couldn't you do that for us? No, there's not enough of us to do it. So you have to take on the responsibility of doing things for, for yourself. Get done with things early. You're try if there's anybody here that does not have a passport, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. If there's somebody here that does not have a passport, when we're done here, go to the post office and put in an application. Because you might have it by the time you're getting ready to travel this summer. Um, so the problem, the slight problem is we're going early on this. Most of you don't know where you're going to be going uh, this summer or whenever it is that you're going to be going. But once you do find out, try to get to your travel documents quickly. And also thinking about other kinds of preparation, and you'll, you'll hear more about health preparation and so forth. Start looking into where you're going to go, where you're going to live, so on and so forth. So there's a few resources we're going to go over here, our website and so forth. First thing I want to tell you about is a registry. How many of you are familiar with the registry that's on the public health website? Nobody. Well, one, I see one hand. That's all going away, and there is now one for the university that is for everybody at the university who's going to be traveling overseas. It's not for domestic travel. We want everybody to be using this, but students are required to do it. And this is solely for the purpose of trying to help you in case you get trouble in trouble overseas. So if you have a medical problem, if you get in trouble with the law, God forbid, whatever, whatever it might be, if there's a natural disaster, we will connect you with International SOS. And we'll have a, present, a bit of a presentation on that as well today. But that is really important. And students will be required to Register. Now, you don't know where you're going, so you can't put an itinerary in. However, you can, if you know you're going to be traveling, you can go into the registry, and there's a link off of our website. You can go to the registry, and you can complete a profile, which is information about yourself, who your next of kin is, so to speak, um, your passport number, so on and so forth. And this is sort of baseline information that doesn't change very much. But it's important to have that in case something happens to you while you're overseas. This is a way of connecting up. So the, this combined with the itinerary that you'll be putting in later on will help the university and International SOS get you out of trouble, if you're in trouble. So the other thing I want to talk to you about is that there's a really great website. Um, there's a, a tool that was created by folks here at Berman and at um, Stanford on uh, bioethics for short-term uh, 
experiences. And I think it's really important. It's a case-based type of thing, uh, and it's very, very helpful for you. And you'll, we'll be talking about some cases today, but this is a little bit more in depth about ethical issues. So we, this is something we want you to do before you go away. Um, our website has a lot of the information you need, and the way to do it is you go to our website, globalhealth.org, you drill down to student travel, and then you drill down to travel resources, and then you have lots and lots of information, including the stuff from today will be up in a couple weeks. Last year's stuff is there now. This, today's presentation will be up there in a couple weeks. So you know, just take, talk about visas a lot because that was an issue. You are responsible for getting your own visa and we encourage you to do that as soon as you find out really where you're gonna be going. You'll have to do it yourself, but the best thing to do is to work with, um, there is, by the way, a document on our website about this that sort of summarizes uh, the visa thing, but work with uh, uh, the State Department on and where to go you can go to the, the country that you're going to, and they usually have a, on the website for their embassy in Washington to have information about visas. So you need to do that. There may be a couple of wrinkles, and you should try to talk to the people you're going to be working with, the, your Hopkins mentor, for example, about if there's any particular wrinkles about getting a visa. It's very, very important. So, and oh, one thing, international students who are going to travel really need to go to the Hopkins um, What's the exact name of that office? Office yeah, Office of International Services. The people you probably coordinated with when you came here at Hopkins. You need to talk to them before you leave because if you don't do things right, you could leave the country and may not be able to come back. So if you're an international student, if you're not from the United, if you're not a U.S. citizen coming from another country, before you go away this summer to some other country, talk to them. They can help you with this. Christina's gonna do a little blurb about just specific to IH students. Hi everybody, good to see all of you back. I uh, just wanted to make sure that you all know um, there is a green sheet with all of your names going passing around. Please, if you haven't signed it, you need to sign it before you leave because we this is a required training and we do keep track of all the people that are taking this training. Uh, so, all of these students, all of you guys are going to most more than likely going to travel abroad for a few weeks up to perhaps a year or even more. And you guys have to be just very cognizant of the things that you need to do here before you leave. Uh, so we're going to start with, um, there we have an international travel, it's called a checklist, but we've just changed it to a form. All of you guys, it doesn't matter where you go, aside from the travel registry, the travel registry that, that, that uh, Dick Dunning's just told you about is something that you guys need to do. You, 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 you need to create your profile, put in your passport number, put in everything there. But aside from that, the, I, the International Health Department requires all, to, for all the IH students to fill out a form. And I can just show you a little, pretty much what it is. I made it into a Google form, a Google document, where you have to fill out all of it, okay? It's a, just a few pages. I can't, I can't go further because I need to fill all this out, but it's going, it's, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's extensive. It's going to ask you how long you're gonna be traveling, if you have approvals for IRB, if you have local coordinators approved, or uh, if you have local mentors, where are you going to be, um, where you're going to be staying, and if you're traveling to a country with travel warnings. The U.S. State Department has a list of countries in tra with travel warnings, and we take that very seriously. We need to review every every um, student's travel before they go to a country with travel warnings. For, like some of them is Mexico is in there, Afghanistan, um, yeah, mm -hmm. Kenya is in there right now, uh, and we we have to review everybody. There is a process because we are really we're looking out for your safety. So you need to go and, and fill all of this out. And you have to do it as soon as possible. It doesn't matter if you don't have plane tickets. If you're thinking that you're going to be going there in a few months, you know, perhaps in May or June, and then it's delayed till August, that's fine. Just, may, just fill this out with the approximate dates, and then you can just email me and saying, I have the dates. These are the actual dates. That's fine, okay? But I need all of this filled out. The important thing is, uh, another important thing is, if you're going to travel with 
and doing projects, international health projects, if you're going to get paid with IH, through IH, doing, you know, working with a faculty member, doing projects, and you're going to, most doctoral students are going to go through this. If you're going to be moving to a different country for more than three months, up to a year, some, some students decide to move there with their families and, and live somewhere else for a year or two. And that happens a lot. Doctoral students, and I know I see a lot of you here, you're going to do this at some point. Um, we need to know this, and we need to know prior for you to, to leaving, because just like Virginia doesn't like that, you know, that they, we have to pay income taxes if we live in Virginia, but we work here, or, you know, like if just states want to get their income tax, countries want to get their income tax. So there's tax, um, there, there, there are, we're starting to see a lot of people getting um, taxed afterwards, and there are a lot of problems in that sense. So if you're getting paid through here, but then you're moving, you need to fill this out. There's a section that says student employment. You need to let us know, because we need to figure that out. We need to figure that out the taxes, and that might take a few months, which means that you're not gonna get paid for a few months. So. The other thing is the identity verification. If it's not done here, yes. Yeah. Have you need I-9s here, you need to get set up here. So a lot of students are saying, just came to me, one, one student just came to me last week saying, I'm leaving on Wednesday. Well, that doesn't work because then you know, she knows that she's not gonna get paid for at least three months. That's, you know, so you need to have a lot of savings. Um, <laughs> seriously, that's how it goes. <laughs> and let's just go back to Franklin's slide. Um, so yeah, so be cognizant of the, tr of the travel to countries, travel warning forms. Uh, this agenda has all of the information that you need here from uh, the tiny URLs has our policy and it also has our, our Google document and a tiny URL and it also has the more travel checklist, travel forms, and it also has other pertinent information that, that you will be using. So please, I can also email this to you so you have this, but just so you know, this is really important information. Okay. So. Yeah, if you change, I mean, there's the one thing about the registry is if you, something happens, let's say you get overseas and your project seems to change location, like across another part of the country, you can go to the registry remotely and sign in. You'll have to go through um, Hopkins Connect to do it, unfortunately, for now. But if you go, you can go to the registry remotely and you can update all that information so that we can help you out, but clearly there's also a requirement for the Department of International Health as well. Okay. Needed to know that. And another thing, if you are going, to, if you're traveling to a country with a travel warning form, you cannot travel until we give you the approval. So that's that's something that you need need to be mindful. Do not buy a plane ticket until you know that you are approved to travel. And, and not just by the advisor. No, like by the department. Essentially, by the yeah. department. I need to send you an email saying it's okay. Okay, next up, I um, wanted to do Dr. Hines. Uh, Dr. Noreen Hines is, uh, operates the uh, Travel Medicine Clinic here. And Noreen, travel and Tropical Medicine. Yes, and Noreen is a good friend, an old friend. Not, she's not old, we're no, a we're long time. Uh, Stick and have I have worked tenure. together for years. Yes. Okay, even when I worked at CDC, um, Dick and I were working. someone clutching the side of a lectern to talk to me. God, it's hideous. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm gonna do today, I'm not gonna tell you this is what you need to do to stay healthy. That, um, and you do the following and take this and you take that. Needless to say, you're all going to different places and everyone in this room has a different background that they carry in terms of where you've already been, where you grew up, whether here in the United States or elsewhere, what your tolerance for risk is, how much you wanna make sure that you travel, do you wanna to travel totally like in a bubble? Do you wanna make sure you don't get anything? 
Okay, everyone is different. So what we're gonna talk about today is how you get to the point where you're comfortable before you travel uh, being ready to do that, okay? So how many people in this room um, have lived, worked, or visited a low resource country? Okay, how many of you have lived in a low resource country that is not your country of origin? Okay. And how many of you have done that for one year or more? Okay, so now we've sort of uh, changed uh, where things are, okay? So, how many of you, before you went and did that, uh, went and consulted with someone who could provide you with guidance uh, on prevention and staying healthy while you were abroad. Oh, fewer, fewer, okay, so, okay, so here we go. All of this is not to tell you uh, what to do, but prepare, but rather how to prepare yourself to do it, okay? Doreen, would you like me to advance these for you? Oh, okay, that's fine, thanks, pictures, oh nice, okay. So the whole thing is just about prevention. Okay, and it, notice you heard this from Dick. You're responsible for it because everyone's here as an adult. Why do you want anyone here to hold your hand? Because everyone has, doesn't have the same needs. But if you notice in every single thing listed on this prevent guideline, you is in it. So there is something you need to consider or do. Okay, so you prepare yourself. Okay, that's number one beginning the whole thing. What are you gonna do to prepare yourself to go to stay healthy? Um, and then there's a thing that many of you uh, probably know about because of your studies, the whole concept of the risk analysis paradigm, a risk assessment, risk communication, and risk management. There are two sides to the risk assessment. A healthcare provider might do a risk assessment with you of considering your health background, your underlying health conditions, et cetera, but you also do a risk assessment for yourself. Every time you decide that you're going to uh, walk across the street when the, when the light is not green, or you're going to jaywalk in the middle of a block, you've done a risk assessment, believe it or not, that's assessed on not, chances are I'm not gonna get hit by a car when I do this. Okay, so you're gonna do a risk assessment so that when you ultimately go and see someone, because I understand there is a requirement that you go to see someone prior to travel for a travel health assessment, that you'll be prepared to go there. And then you need to educate yourself because you make a visit with a pro healthcare provider who's going to assist you if you haven't made yourself smarter about where you're going. Because even if you have lived and worked overseas extensively, chances are you're going to a new location under new conditions and you wanna make yourself a bit smarter about that. And even if you yourself are from a low resource uh, country, another country that you would go to actually poses different challenges than you may have um, grown up with and been very accustomed to dealing with all of your life. Um, so that's educating yourself. We're gonna talk a little bit more about vaccines and other tools to stay healthy because yes, uh, it is uh, for some of you going to some countries, there will be some immunizations, at least one that may be required for your entry. Then you have to uh, sort of, once you have a plan of what you wanna do, you're gonna have to evaluate it because there are a lot of things that come into the mix as you're going to see. It's not only like, uh, what would I d ideally like and what, um, and what can I afford are two important questions, okay? And then your needs assessment, and we'll talk about that a bit more, and then your travel medicine visit, how you get there, um, where you can go, where are the potential uh, locations and how to do that. Okay, Dick, can I have the next slide? So really this is all about, this whole thing is all about prevention. You don't wanna get sick, you wanna be able to do whatever the, um, the project is that you're working on for whatever amount of time that you're there, but also you wanna be able to enjoy um, your weekends, your evenings, et cetera, being able to discover uh, greater things about the culture and the location that you're in, so why be sick? So it's all about you, the who, what, what is it you wanna be doing, where are you gonna be going, et cetera, and how are you gonna do it? And again, reminding you that it's, you're gonna do a risk assessment for yourself, you're gonna have a communication with a healthcare provider, 
uh, regarding uh, staying healthy because it's required in order for you to go overseas. And then you'll work with that person um, in that location to come up with uh, what is the management that you're going to do. What vaccines, are there particular medications you're going to take, et cetera. Next slide. So, I hope this, this slide really encapsulates the whole thing that you need to consider. So if you only take a, a few things away, take this slide away from you, which my understanding is everyone's being provided with. You should research the country you're going to, okay, in some detail, you know, and the location where you're going, okay, and how do you do that? Well, what does the CDC yellow book say? Um, you might never have heard of this before, some of you have. If you Google CDC yellow book, okay, this book that's online, you can look up the country you're going to, it'll talk about diseases in the country, and you can look all of these things up. You can start at the very beginning of the book. You can say, oh, what's a healthy traveler supposed to do? How do you prepare yourself? Additionally, CDC has on its website, for those of you who uh, require a yellow fever vaccination, it will give you all the yellow fever vaccination sites around the country, for example, if you're going home and on a visit and you wanna go someplace, and even the ones here in, in the greater Washington, D.C., Baltimore corridor. Okay, so what do they say about what you should do? What are the types of health risks, okay? And then uh, what does CDC recommend? And why is that particular thing important? CDC and WHO work together on many of these, for those of you who are not uh, US uh, uh, residents or citizens, um, work very carefully with WHO. And there's a lot of harmonization about recommendations. So no matter where you go um, to have your health consultation, they will be providing you with recommendations. Not that they've pulled de novo out of their own heads, but they'll put them within a framework of what CDC has recommended for travelers who are doing uh, whatever type of thing they're going to be doing. So some of the things that we think of as pre prevention modalities include vaccines, and you should know ahead of time. And this is why it's important for you to research ahead of time where you're going and what might be recommended because vaccines come in three flavors. They come in the required type, and there are only, there's only one universally potentially required one, and that's yellow fever vaccination for certain countries. Now, there are other countries for which it's recommended, but they're not gonna meet you as you, as you walk in and say, show me your certificate of yellow fever vaccination that you can only get from a bona fide site here in the United States, which has what's called a uniform stamp for yellow fever, okay? So you can't go to a general practitioner any place. They have to be uh, an official site that, um, that CDC has authorized to give the vaccine. Whether or not you're getting it as a requirement or because the country, it's recommended by CDC for people going to that country. The second type are recommended vaccines. These are typically not vaccines that you would get if you were um, staying, let's say, here in the United States. They're ones that travelers might wish to consider, but are not required to enter the country, but recommended by CDC and often also WHO, such as typhoid vaccine or hepatitis A vaccine. Because who would like to get hepatitis A? You know, you're all, everyone in this room is, with rare exceptions, of course, not people up here with gray hair like myself, are young, and therefore, you know, hepatitis A wouldn't really do too much bad to you except put you under the weather for a month or more, but it's a nasty disease, you really don't want it for example, or typhoid, which uh, untreated, even though it is a treatable bacterial disease, kills 30% of people um, if it is not caught early. So you wouldn't particularly wanna get typhoid, for example, if that's an issue. And then routine. These are ones that you should be up to date on just living here, okay? You should probably get these from your healthcare provider, not from a travel medicine clinic, because travel medicine clinics okay, do not take insurance. They are payment at time of service. And the reason is every, just about every insurance policy on the face of the earth has decided that if you're rich enough to travel, you're rich enough to pay <laughs> for the vaccines. I'm really not kidding you. And uh, under the new healthcare reform in the United States, these will not be covered either, okay? So trust me, it's already been determined, not covered. 
So anything that's routine that you see on the CDC website that says routine adult vaccination, get it from your healthcare provider first because if it's routine and recommended, your insurance will cover it. But not in any travel clinic because they'll charge you and then you can go through the administrative nightmare of putting it through to your insurance, okay? So that's number one, vaccines. But it's beyond vaccines. Then there are medications. What kind of medications? You can take some medicine to prevent, such as taking a uh, preventive for malaria, if you're going to a malaria endemic region. There are uh, medicines to take post-exposure, okay? Um, so, for example, if you did not take pre-exposure um, rabies immunization, which many people do not, then post-exposure you would need a treatment. Okay, for example, and what would that mean? And then there are treatments themselves. So many people take with them self-treatment for traveler's diarrhea, because God forbid, I can't imagine anyone in this room is gonna eat street food uh, 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 where you're going, okay? So uh, to self-treat traveler's diarrhea, for example. Okay, and then what about personal issues? These are actually probably the most important thing. What do you think is the most um, common illness that people get when they travel? Diarrhea. Right, exactly. But does diarrhea kill you? No, nah, not, not usually. It could, but not usually. What's the most frequent cause of death? Road traffic accidents. So of course, on terms of personal protections, you can in your own mind, think how, what does this translate to? So if you're, your place going, if you're going to Uganda, for example, as your project, riding on a boat of Boda is probably not a great idea with or without a helmet, okay? But making sure that you drive in a taxi that actually has seat belts is, okay? So um, you have to do your own risk assessment, okay? Um, very important, okay? So you can see some other things, safe food. And you're going, many of you will be staying for quite some time. What do you do in your own household to prepare your food as opposed to what do you do when you go out to a restaurant? How do you modify your behavior? Insecticide treated bed nets. Ah, very important for sleeping under, okay? Because what are the things other than malaria they'll help pre prevent? These are the things you wanna educate yourself about. What about insect repellent? Ah, the dengue mosquito. How many of you have already had a course in which dengue's been discussed? Okay, remember, 80s mosquitoes bite from dawn till dusk and also are a little stupid, so if there's a lot of ambient light from neon, they also will bite you at night. So there's no vaccine yet. So of course, dengue's an unpleasant, doesn't kill you, but you feel like you wanna die for anyone in this room who's ever had dengue, it's a nasty. Now see 105 fever, worst headache of your life. You feel someone like, like someone's pushing behind your eyeballs. It's terrible. You wouldn't want that. So insect repellent is fun. And here, let's not forget condoms, okay? I know a lot of people say, no, no, well, I'm doing my best. No, sir, I won't be involved. <laughs> it's like, oh, come on, you know? It was very, very fascinating. <laughs> you know, in 1997, the United States Peace Corps did this big survey. They had CDC come in and do a big survey among Peace Corps volunteers. You know, they gave education and everything. You know, I can't tell you. All the volunteers said, I'm not having sex for my two years as a Peace Corps volunteer. <laughs> you know, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Do you really think that for two years no one's gonna have sex? Okay. So anyway, so then they came back two years later and those who hadn't uh, left country earlier or anything, they surveyed them, okay? How many, what percentage do you think kept to that, I'm not gonna have sex with them? Three. Okay, <laughs> you're high, <laughs> okay? So, for example, that becomes very important. So that means you have, uh, for women, make sure you have whatever birth control you're gonna take. Condoms, condoms might not, the quality of condoms might not be so hot where you're going, so you might wanna take them with you. Remember, condoms not only can prevent pregnancy, but their other important thing is sexually transmitted diseases. So if you are females and you are on some form of oral contraceptive or Depo-Provera, wonderful in preventing pregnancy, but not the other sexually transmitted conditions, HIV, hepatitis C, et cetera, okay? So those are things we want you to consider. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay, so the final thing is deciding what's ideal for me, 
okay? The ideal is, oh, I'd love to have, I'd like to travel in a bubble, I, I don't want to ac actually have any bug bites, etc. And what will you tolerate, okay? What's acceptable that you absolutely don't want to get the follow? <coughs> and then you make your decisions based upon what's tolerable to you, and I hate to tell you how much money you have and how much time until you travel, okay? So consider all of those things when you go to travel. Next one. So here's the ideal. Two to three months before you depart, plan. There's nothing to say that you can't have your travel medicine visit now. You know, you don't have to get all the vaccines now, but you can get the information. Okay, visit and vaccines are not, as I said, completely covered. Get your routine vaccines before you show up for your travel medicine visit and decide how much money you're going to spend before you ever show up for that visit because it will help you in decision making. And actually, if you've gone to the CDC website, if you've done your homework and researching where you'll go, you'll have a very good idea of what you want to take. And know that before you go, okay? Next slide. And the last thing I wanna tell you on that sheet, our address is wrong. Where do you go? Okay, you don't have to come to us. You can go to Passport Health, you can go to a minute clinic that has, um, can run travel medicine clinics, but the address here, and we are no longer in the Johns Hopkins Outpatient Center. We are in room WB031, right here in this building, one floor underneath you, okay? Thank you to Dean Clagg, who helped us relocate when we needed to move out of our other space. So we're only a staircase away, okay? The telephone yes, numbers are, right. Yes, sir. Uh, for travel vaccines, do the clinics and they have, is there like a standardized price that they'll tend to charge or is very picky? No, so to give you a very good example, we are an academic based uh, travel medicine clinic. So the School of Medicine and the Department of Medicine um, imposes a tax on everything we take in. So uh, we have to put a 25% excise on all of our prices because the 25% of everything we take in, the Department of Medicine um, takes and the School of Medicine takes. Although we're here in the School of Public Health. You'll see. So an independently uh, standalone, it will be cheaper. Okay, but everyone in Johns Hopkins Travel and Tropical Medicine who sees you every single person has lived, worked, or traveled extensively overseas. 20 or more countries for just about everyone who's there. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. So at the risk of adding more, but I just wanna underscore a couple of things that Noreen said. One, one thing I just wanna mention that she did mention is it's very important to go to a provider that's been certified in travel medicine, correct? So the other thing uh, to underscore is that our students, when they come back from travel, we evaluate what they've done, and one of the questions we ask them is what kinds of problems they had. And two of the most uh, frequently reported problems they've had is being a victim of a petty crime and being sick. So there you go. And Noreen's reference to Uganda is not unwarranted because there is a student from Michigan who did end up dying because he rode on a boat of Oda without, without a uh, helmet. And he was thrown, well, the, they hit another vehicle, the driver was fine, he had a helmet, the student died. Yeah. So. Well, and the other thing is, not that I want anyone to be sick at, but this type of uh, presentation is, uh, we also have uh, Uganda Crime Service also in the Johns Hopkins Medicine Service. So we're happy to see you if you're sick. It's not that we want you to be sick and come back, but that's actually part of the reason. So I just want to, the next item on the agenda is a discussion of international SOS, and we're fortunate to have uh, Larry Foley, who's the Director of Risk Management for, for the university, who's here to talk about that. Larry. Great. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Why do we talk about SOS? We talk about SOS primarily because we're concerned about safety of all of our international travelers. 
What is SOS? Essentially, it's a travel assistance tool. And this program applies to all faculty, staff, and students of Johns Hopkins University. Program free features, medical services. Um, a point to emphasize, this does not replace your health insurance. Um, you're, you're all, you all have health insurance, and that's the primary source of funding. SOS does provide some medical assistance. Security services, we can go into a little more detail. Uh, there are plenty of online programs on the SOS website. If you haven't visited the site, I encourage you to do so. There's some great in-country information. Let's just give some level of the resources that SOS have. They've vetted clinics around the world, so if you do unfortunately have a medical emergency or some sort of condition, they can refer you to a clinic that's appropriate for your condition. The primary medical services, uh, what they will cover is emergency medical evacuation. Um, typically, you know, we, we've, we've had that done with Hopkins in the past few years. They will pay for that assistance, um, but what they will also do is provide you with local referrals you know, for uh, medical clinics, uh, emergency routine care. Um, personal travel assistance, they provide some legal referrals, translation service, uh, if you lose your passport, those sorts of things. It's another resource to get that uh, information. Security service, um, they do provide a lot of um, country security information prior to your trip. They will provide email updates as situations change. And we saw, as we saw recently in Egypt, they provided some emergency evacuations for Hopkins students um, last spring. Again, Security Online, there's a lot of great information. I encourage you, once you know where you're going to be traveling, take the time to look at those websites and, and do your due diligence. Some of the pre-trip pre -trip things that we like to emphasize is you should talk to your own health insurer before you travel. Talk to them about what coverage they provide in a certain country and what the process is to get reimbursements. By and large, it's going to be an indemnification process, i.e., you pay for the claim in most situations and process reimbursement um, through your insurance company when it's appropriate. In an emergency situation, if a hospital won't accept your insurance, you don't, you don't have resources, the university will provide a guarantee of payment to make sure you ultimately get your services. In that instance, we will work with you after the fact to go back to your health insurer and get reimbursed in that situation. That's sort of the last line, but you know, we encourage you to understand what insurance you have in place before you go over there and what the claim process will be. Um, we've talked about an emergency response plan, um, travel itineraries, um, and definitely using the uh, JHU travel registry. This registry is automatically linked to SOS with their information. Once you fill out this profile and your trip information, SOS will have it as well as university personnel. You know, again, medical referrals. I want to talk about some limitations. Again, your health insurance is your primary method of payment. Um, some of the excluded activities, if you're abroad for an extended period of time, people like to engage in, in, in what are known as high-risk activities. These are things that are not going to be covered by SOS. So. Um, Think about the risk process when you think about caving or mountaineering or rock climbing or you know, skydiving, those sorts of things. Questions? Well, you want to just talk a little bit more about this whole issue of if a student gets in trouble medically and they don't have the money to pay, how that works. Yeah. Assuming that they have insurance that will cover it. Yeah, he, here's a process, and it's, it's really, you know, again, I, Step one is to make sure you understand what coverage you have before you go on, on your trip. When you're presented with an emergency, emergency situation, you call SOS. They will refer you, refer you to the closest appropriate medical facility. It might be in the same city. It might be far away. In the event it requires a medical evacuation, they will assist in providing transport and paying for the transport to a different location. Your health insurance will be the primary source of payment for the actual treatment. Um, but in the event, the facility that we refer you to, you're in a situation or a country or location where they will not provide services unless you guarantee payment. When you contact SOS, you make, they'll make that request and they'll come to my office and we will authorize payment and guarantee that payment on behalf of the individual. When you return, we will look to your cooperation to assist in processing the insurance reimbursement, which can take some time. But bottom line, we want to make, you, we want to make sure you get the appropriate um, 
health care that you need. We just want to go through the proper process to make sure the appropriate funding source is in place. Yes. I would, I mean, I, I guess my res initial response would be then you probably don't have health insurance. If you're planning on going abroad, I would look at other sources of health insurance information before you make that decision. And that's why you have that conversation early on, because most insurers will provide an endorsement or provide extended coverage, but you've got to you know, do it ahead of time. Obviously, you can't do it after the fact. Yeah, we have an SOS identification card that I think Dick and his staff have. We can provide you with those cards. It's, a, it's an ATM card, essentially. It has phone numbers on and plan information and a, and a group member ID. And the group ID is the same for faculty, staff, and students. It's the same program. And I think those will be distributed. Um, Actually, well, we don't distribute. Well, my agent might, might distribute it, but there's a, uh, a link on our website where you can actually pull up a PDF of that card and it has the number on it. So that's what you need to get and on the website you want to look at the call center numbers because you can they can be called you can call over from overseas Absolutely. You are. yeah there, there's there's call centers around the world and, and there's three phone numbers on the back of the card I think it's three Noel right um, yeah, you, you call the location closest to you yeah. You know, we had examples of students in Haiti during the earthquake was it three, four years ago when they were evacuated using, using the telephone, contacting SOS, and, and arranging some um, charter air to get them out of the country. Great. So next, we have a very interesting um, Discussion that this is something that we're going to ask you to get involved with. We have uh, two faculty members, Pablo Yuri and Christine George, and, and a student, John Yi uh, Lee, who um, are going to talk about some cases and basically get you to thinking about some cultural issues, ethical issues, and so forth that you might encounter overseas. So, great. Please come up. We're gonna, I'm not sure how we're going to do this yeah, maybe, because there's only one. Maybe pass the one back yeah, maybe you can just pass it between yourselves. Okay. All right, so I think how the structure of this is going to work is we're going to go through first explain the case. And then we're going to have you break off and talk about it for five minutes or two no, minutes. Like two minutes. Just two minutes for one each two, one. And what it, would you do? There will be questions. And then after that, we'll have a discussion together about them. Okay. All right, so we have case one. So case one is probably something that commonly happens that you may have already experienced in your time working in the field. So you're going to work with your local collaborators, and let's say you're going to help them with the epidemiological part of your study. And so when you're out in the field, they propose a study design that you think has methodological issues. For example, you think their sampling design may cause bias in the data that they're collecting. How do you negotiate with your local collaborators to explain your viewpoints when they have theirs and may feel strongly about them? So we'll break off for two minutes and we'll have a discussion about it afterwards. Are there any questions first about the case? Um, so, oh, uh, did you want to explain? I mean, they're not asking you for your opinion. You're just there to, to help. What would you do? You're so a, as a student, yeah, you encounter something, and you're like, eh, this doesn't feel right. That's not what I learned. That's not what I think should be done. Okay, if that's been, it's been an uncomfortable feeling for you, what do you do with that information? So I think it's all of those things are in play. How do you and I have an example. When I um, was starting graduate school, I was working in a project in Bolivia, and we were designing an intervention. We were getting information about ecological sanitation and if the community would be accepting of that or not. And um, so the organization that I was working with, they wanted to meet with the community leaders and get their opinion. And I felt strongly that they should also talk with people in the community of all different levels before they made a decision. 
And so in terms of negotiating, as an example, how would you address that? Turn it back so on. So, in terms of the structure, so should I just call on people, or or I can if you want me to. I'm just your, okay. I'm your, I'm your facilitator. And I have one I actually wanted to mention with the, the accidents. We don't know anything about car accidents. We don't. Okay. I can. Uh, I can give an example. I didn't print the cases. Okay, an another 30 seconds or so. We want to try, we have about seven cases we want to get through, so. All right, so did anyone want to contribute in how they thought the, you would negotiate with the local collaborators in terms of implementing the study? Nina, <laughs> sorry to call on you like that. <laughs> Can you speak a little louder, sorry. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And in the end, a lot of times it's the, the local organizations, most of the time it's their decision on what they're gonna do. So even though you may not agree with it, you still try to help them in any way that they have asked you to. Does anyone else have anything else to, to add to that? Uh-huh. I think that's very true. Is it anyone else? I think that's really good, and also in terms of the data collection, sometimes people just focus on collecting the data, but don't think about how they're going to analyze it after, so making sure you come up with a plan for that when you're working with the different organizations. Did you want to say something? So we should probably move on to the next case because we have many cases we're going to be working on.
Hi guys, Antonio, I'm a second year MSPH student. Last summer I went to Cameroon over about two and a half months and did an HIV prevention project there with uh, at-risk populations there, sex workers and MSM. So most of us are pretty widely involved in social networking, Facebook, Twitter, blog, or all three. So this scenario takes a look at what are the things that you can or sh can be shared online and what should not be. So let's take a few moments to discuss among yourselves. Okay, so we'll discuss. So I know that most of us are going to say before we go to the trip, you know, okay, let's discuss. So most of us, before we go on a trip, we might say, hey, we're never going to share all these things with other people, but it's going to come up. You go there, experience something really crazy or cool, and you have this tendency to share it with other people, your family, friends, all these things. So how would you, how would you go about sharing these things? So eliminate the media and summarizing, not too, not too much in details, okay. Anyone else? Just common sense. Okay, what do you mean by that, common sense? <laughs> I mean, just like, make sure you follow the rules of having rules and make sure you follow the organization rules and make sure you have permission for things that you can't like, just be discussed. Absolutely. Remember that you're representing Hopkins and whatever you share on the internet is really kind of a public property. For example, my project dealt with HIV, very sensitive topic, really risky populations, sex workers. So we took a lot of pictures when we were interviewing them and those are the things, for example, are not things that I would wanna put on my blog or Facebook because government, for example, of Cameroon, they might see that picture and identify some of the sex workers and prosecute them or something like that, so. Yeah. Names, definitely. I realize that you know a lot of you are going to be working with sensitive issues, so you know if you're talking about genital mutilation, you probably don't want to have a photograph, you know, that you're putting on Facebook. I'm serious. I I feel like you know you've got to think about what it is yeah, and who you could be identifying and how it could be harmful. You never know who is reading your blog or how that information will be transmitted to other people. So just keep that in mind. I want to add one thing. Um, it may you may limit uh, where you actually post it, but if it's an unusual term and someone searches it, it can pop up from places that you think are not private, and that has happened to a student before. And the site found it, and the the student posted it as. Um, uh, thinking it was a humor way of, uh, of describing something, not, did not feel that it was an insulting way, but the investigators locally found it insulting. So it, this individual thought it was on a private channel, but when you search the word, it came up. So just be aware of that. Sometimes things, Dick? Yeah, the, the one thing that nobody said, and I think it's really important, if you look at the first sentence, you're talking about the context in which you've received this information, that context is protected under the agreements that you have with your research. So you're actually disclosing private information by sharing it elsewhere. And that's a, actually a violation. We could really get in big trouble for that. So and and it doesn't go away case. once it's out there. Okay. Even if you remove all identifiers? No pictures, no names, no places? 
the problem with that is you have this whole thing of indirect identification that becomes possible, especially with the quote. Um, and this actually happens if you go drill down data. And let's say you were doing some data on sentences, sentence tracks. Uh, if you drill down uh, to a particular subgroup, you can actually identify a person indirectly. So it becomes really important to really think about what you're doing. It's not really risk for your university to damage that person or share that information. It, it's amazing how easy it is to track things down and how easy it is to reach dean level when <laughs> problems go bad. I mean, it was something that was a very harmless thing in the student's eyes, but that investigator found it. It was a very odd thing, and so I like to share that story because it's a real one. The student survived, the site survived, but it was quite a ordeal. So anyway, here, let's go to the next one. Who is, oops, you. So this is the case number three, and here is uh, associated with the traffic. So this is a typical case that happened very often. So I'm living for 12 years in the city of Iquitos, and some of the people who's here be there. So there is no car in Iquitos. Everything is doing by motorcycle or motor taxis, and no one use helmet because it's a tropic, it's very hot and humid. So that's a, is gonna, and most of another country, that's something that happened very often. Right, so take a minute and talk about what you think, how to handle it. So, okay, let's come, let's uh, discuss it as a group so we can keep moving. I see students getting up and leaving, hi, bye, one walking out the door right there. Um, if you could, we'd like to actually, we take, to get through these before you all leave. I know the time and we know the time, but if we can try and talk, discuss these before you go, it would be really appreciated to hold attention, yeah. My, my, my only comment about that is from the perspective from here, it's very easy to say, no, I'm not gonna jump to the motorcycles. But when you're in a city, like everyone's in a motorcycle without helmet, and it's my transportation, it's gonna be hard to say no. But believe me, say no. I've been wearing, I have a motorcycle, I use a motorcycle on the field, and you wear a helmet. People make jokes like uh, I use a refrigerator in my head. But uh, yes, but I am alive. And it's the same, I am Ambassador Hopkins and from Hopkins School of Public Health and for me it makes sense to use a helmet to protect myself. So you need to do the same. And you need to explain to people what it means being a motorcycle with a helmet. What would you recommend if you choose to use another helmet? Yeah. Don't go on a motorcycle, but look for another. I mean, if you don't have another option, you should be doing it. You should be doing it. Do you recommend students come with a helmet? That's an interesting question, right? So even where would you get one, or you know that might be a situation you're encountering? Um, hey, no, because... No. Uh, Are there places that you recommend students get one? Try to ask that question before you go. I would talk to your faculty advisor, the person you'd be working with, and see what sort of transportation issues you might have so that they could recommend. In general, I don't recommend use uh, motorcycles when you are in the field for the students. Two deaths that we can cite are the Michigan, uh, the Minnesota student and the Duke student, and they were both helmet-related deaths. So we would like you not to die. So yes, we recommend helmet. In most of the countries, either in Nikita, when no one uses helmet, the law say the law say that you need to use a helmet in a motorcycle, and it's a universal law. Yeah. So, it's not just and I wanted to 
to give a scenario too that actually happened to me when I was um, working on a project in Indonesia. So I was on a motorbike taxi and the driver had actually given me his helmet and we crashed. Um, and the driver was hurt and people were coming and surrounding us. And so I threw the helmet down and went running away. And some people would say that you should stop and see if the person's okay. But in that type of situation, I think the best approach is probably to leave the situation. I don't know what you think, Pablo, on that one. Yeah. Because, you were, because people were upset that you had the helmet? And you had the no, because people were surrounding and looking at the situation and it's not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, especially the person that we had hit and they had gotten into an argument. So, yeah. Either helmet or not, ride the motorcycle is in dangerous things. And you have a problem here in the U.S. and in Europe, you don't have support. If you are a problem there, you're in trouble. So you need to try to avoid the maximum that you can the risky situation and be in a motorcycle is a risky situation. Which goes back to what Noreen said. Look at your risk assessment before you go. Yeah, next one. Go ahead. Okay, this is another situation like uh, it's very common. I've been in, in this situation very often and I can probably, if you've been working for a long term or mid mid time in a, in a project that's been involved in a situation close like that. What, what, to me, what I recommend in this kind of situation is you always, what I do is I never give an answer at the moment and I talk with my supervisor, su su supervisor, the person, the people who I work with or the people who know this person. I talk and I explain what happened. Not to try to, not in the incriminatory way, so, you know, say, hey, this person told me that she's in trouble with his family or she's having a personal trouble and he asked me help in money. What, what it should be do is, what can I we deal with, with? And I never take a decision by myself. It's not like an impulsive decision, like a, when someone asks me for money, I take my wallet and give the money. So no, because this is the best way to do it for me, is like a, analyze the situation, share with other person, see what other people say, but be careful to, to try to don't, don't do it in an incrimination, incriminated way. Like uh, if you use, because if you go to the supervisor and say, hey, this person asked me for money, probably the supervisor can be a jail or jail the other person for active Has anybody had that? Been asked for money? A lot of you said you traveled. What, did the group you were with have a, a process to help you deal with that? Yeah, so they instilled a scholarship program. Oh, nice. It's really small stuff scholarship. So you guys could donate to that? Yeah. That's a good idea. Anybody else? Yeah. But again, common sense. Yes. Uh, Did you want to comment on that? Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I actually would have this conversation about money before you leave here with the group you're working with, with the faculty, with the organization, and say, look, I know this is something, share these cases and say, this might happen. How do you recommend I handle it? Because 
they probably have encountered it before. That may be okay, and it, it would be nice to have them behind you saying, yes, we say don't give money, and then that, that, that would be helpful. Or they say, there's a scholarship thing set up, or there's other ways that you can help. I, I, so real, I'm glad you brought that up. Bring, have a discussion before you leave. Okay, so we'll go on to, is this on? Um, so we'll go on to the last case now. Since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just go through it really quickly, and then I'm interested to hear maybe some of your own experiences on this. Is the microphone working? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that um, so you're in, the, you're in the village, and you're getting cat calls. So as a woman, you're walking through, and you're walking maybe the same way that you always walk, and people are calling out to you. Um, how do you deal with this situation? So maybe some of the Peace Corps volunteers or people who have worked extensively abroad, can they share some of their, how they dealt with that? April? <laughs> Depends on how long you're in the village. Okay. Um, well, it's, yeah, because it was like, it depends on how long you're in the village. Like, in Morocco and like Arabic, I would say that like, oh, okay, why don't you connect to your mom? Because, <laughs> no, because it was actually like, hey, think about that. Like, would you say that to like a woman that you respect? Like, that kind of response. But I don't think anyone would really say it to my mom. Mm. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I think of an example I had um, lived in Bangladesh for two years, and a lot of times when I would go running around Dhaka, which I know is a little bit crazy, <laughs> a lot of times people would call out to me, but I didn't feel comfortable to say anything because it was people who I didn't know, um, and I run similar paths on a, each week, and so my approach was just to ignore it. But I guess in a more rural setting, the situation may be different. Does anyone else have any final remarks related to that? All right. I think we can just not as a just as a large group maybe talk about this because I think this happens a lot. It kind of goes on with what Noreen was saying about you know you bringing condoms with you. How do you deal with social settings? You're all going to socialize, um, and who may have varied backgrounds. You might uh, if people have experiences or do that they might want to share about this. What would you consider when socializing with peers and coworkers? You had, you had another comment about what, whether women can go to certain places, not even with whether you're together, but whether you could with your own American colleague, your own expat colleague, go into a place together. Is that within the social norm? Yeah, so when I was living in, in Bangladesh, I would go with expat men to different things, but I wouldn't necessarily go with a Bangladeshi man out somewhere to have dinner or something like that because it could be viewed as not culturally appropriate. Even in terms of my living situation, I had a male flatmate. And um, we had to explain to the landlord that we oh. were in separate rooms and, um, and to allow us to do that. But there was a situation with another student who actually came and um, the landlord, they got into an argument. The landlord actually had the police come and remove her and accuse her of being a prostitute. So you have to be really careful when it comes to those types of situations. I, I will say, yeah, just a second to say about alcohol. Um, you're in some countries where alcohol is not consumed. Uh, and being mindful of that, but even if you're in countries where it can be consumed, uh, consuming it in a way that's appropriate. And uh, we have had situations where that hasn't been, and if you think you're with somebody that's having a problem talking it through. Uh, has anybody been in a scenario like that where they're overseas? I know we've all been in those scenarios, but overseas where you're in an uncomfortable situation where someone's drinking too much or somebody's, yeah, you want to, yeah. yeah. Probably there, yeah. I mean, it's a, it it's comes up every year as feedback on a couple of people's evaluations. So. Yeah, that's Same. something. That's ever I mean, when you drink, you know, you 
lose part of your capacity, your perception, especially and, and particularly when you are in a country, when you are using your second language, you lose most of the time the ability to communicate. So you are vulnerable, but when you drink, you are born more vulnerable, more vulnerable. Uh -huh. On the situation, so for I'm being in here two or three cases, like uh, students go to the parties, and after the parties, invite to the uh, people, local people, to go to the student's house to continue the party and the, uh, having the conversation, and uh, unfortunately, things disappear from the house. Yeah. So nothing happened with the personal integrity, but they affect the security for the rest of the group. It's not associated with being drunk, but it's associated with uh, judgment. Yes, man. It's just and yeah. the Any same. Any other thing you yeah. had or Dick, or if you want to share anything, it's just something to be aware of. But, um, also, if you're a woman, you might consider also carrying a ring around when you go there. Oh. Or bring some kind of a, uh, agreement with maybe like a trusted friend, colleague, so he could be your pretend husband or whatever. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to your white lie thing. Yeah, <laughs> there might be. There might be situations where you do that. There's more cases that we have that we're going to post up that we really would recommend you actually to pull this up with the person you're going to travel with. The reason is you want to know what they have in place to help support you. Um, and so it's just a way to, to engage in some conversation. So hopefully this has been helpful today to get this conversation started. Thank you for the time. Dick, do you have any other closing well, thoughts? Thank you very much. This will all be on the Center for Global Health website. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I do have one little thing. We're going to, we did take attendance and hopefully we have email addresses. We were, we would like to evaluate this program. And so we're, we would ask you to please complete that uh, evaluation. It's gonna be short. We're not gonna be like 10 pages of questions, but we'd appreciate your feedback. Thank you.